tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Good evening, you're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome, dear listeners, to Season 11, Episode 18. I'm your host, Otis Jari, and in this episode, I'll be performing four tales to terrify you, courtesy of author Nick Boddick. Tonight, we will hear about unwanted hotel visitors, fares best left on the curb, authorial inspirations, and body horror. Ooh. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two spine-tingling stories. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now, it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail... So lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show is about to begin. <laughs> now, a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Let's say you have a problem first. The creative living in your closet isn't staying put. And then there's the zombie that has the car mechanic trapped in your garage, so you can't get your flat tire repaired. Then there's another problem, and then another. And then suddenly, you're focused too much on problems, and not on how to solve them. Now, you don't necessarily want somebody solving all your problems for you. Some problems, when you face them head on and solve them, can improve your mood, your confidence, and get you to the right place you need to be. Therapy is just one option to get you to that good frame of mind, and I know there's a place to try if you think it might be the right answer for you. BetterHelp. BetterHelp is online therapy that works to fit your needs. It's affordable care where sessions can be done via text, phone call, or video chat. Just take a brief survey and you can be matched with a therapist within 24 hours, and you can switch at any time. I know it may seem like a small thing, but I know when I finally solve something that's been bothering you, I feel better, more confident, and better able to tackle the bigger problems in life. I want you, dear listener, to have that same opportunity. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com horror today and get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash horror. You surely have stopped to a hotel is horrific enough without anything else happening. I mean, between the smell of deodorizer, the sheets of dubious cleanliness, and the sounds you may hear through the walls that you certainly hope are people having a good time and nothing else. But sometimes, 
You might find the other guests in the hotel aren't quite the nice, normal people you hope they are. Sometimes they might just be different. Without further ado, I present to you at a hotel in Arkansas. The luxury of sleep is one that I've long accepted as being totally and utterly out of my grasp. A comprehensive review of my life is hardly necessary, although of particular importance is the curse of near-constant insomnia with which I've been stricken since prepubescence. I've thought back at various times throughout the interim and tried to pinpoint a moment or event that acted as the catalyst for my apparent inability to get a good night's rest but the cause for my countless sleepless nights have deftly eluded me. Not that it matters. It simply provides an explanation as to why I was lying on my back, eyes fixed upon the ceiling in a hotel room in Arkansas at 2.15 a.m., bathed by the dull, occasionally flickering glow of the near-muted television. The rattling of the air conditioning unit under the window had ceased at my instruction, and now sat idle, leaving only the indistinguishable, though decidedly enthusiastic banter between the two hosts of a home shopping network to combat the oppressive silence of the tenth floor accommodation in which I idly stirred. Room 1007 was one of the four that capped either side of the bank of elevators, its position ideal for the ease of transporting luggage and coming and going, but it also meant that I became privy to the varied conversations my fellow 10th floor tenants had while waiting to be carted elsewhere in the building, as well as the ding of the arriving car. It had been a quiet night on the other side of the door. Twice only the elevator's arrival had preceded the confused whispers of incoming guests of the hotel, for whom the location of the room on the 10th floor wasn't so straightforward as it had been for me. I can recall the ordeal of that night with more clarity than if I were trying to think of yesterday, and I fear that no memory will ever burn itself into my psyche like the one of that horrid night. I thrust the sterile white sheets and comforter to the side of the kingside bed as the threat of the Arkansan heat, well, it returned during the air conditioner's periods of rest. My thoughts had, like they had so often, it, turned to the death of my younger brother many years prior. Three years my junior, Jacob had succumbed to a heart defect that had plagued him since birth. His wife had awoken to find him dead next to her in their bed. Such were our fraternal bonds that I had seldom spoken to him in the two years preceding his death. Not for any particular reason. There was no grand falling out. Our distance was simply the result of the physical space between us and the inability to imagine a world in which Jacob was not, in the way that the absence of a loved one seemed an impossibility, a foreign concept entirely. The ding of the elevator arriving sounded, creeping through the small space between the floor and the bottom of room 1007's door. My gaze was absently focused upon the ceiling above me, as I heard the faint sound of the elevator doors sliding open, and at that moment I had the familiar pit in the bottom of my stomach, the empty feeling that manifests when I ponder the times I could have been in Jacob's life and wasn't, the times I could have talked to him and didn't, the calls not placed, the trips not taken. I was so preoccupied that it is only in retrospect that I now realize I had heard the elevator's salutation with an inordinate number of times over the past hour. A steady emission of the digital bell, followed by the quiet glide of the doors as they opened and then again as they closed. As I lay ruminating on the very subject that would almost certainly prevent sleep, even if I were fortunate enough to not have it escape me on a nightly basis, I became aware of that short series of sounds as it came with more and more regularity. I sat up in bed and listened closer, silently wondering if the noises weren't merely a product of my subconscious. Moments later, the bell chimed again, 
and I knew for certain that the sound of the sliding elevator doors was indeed real. I continued listening for some time, finding that the pattern repeated itself roughly, but not precisely, every forty seconds. I knew with a frustrated certainty that before long it would become disruptive to my mood and an interference to my productivity the following day. Such is the nature of my protracted war with insomnia, that on any given night, while I may not ever sink into the embrace of unconsciousness, I have, over the years, reached something of a compromise with my enemy, in that I can achieve enough meaningful rest and relaxation to adequately function during the daytime. In order to accomplish this, however, I must lay in relative peace with as few interruptions as possible. And while I find a flickering illumination of a television and the barely audible hum of the accompanying scores and dialogue and sound effects to be quite calming, the repetition of the elevator's bell and doors became more bothersome each time they sounded. During each forty-second respite from the ding and the twin sounds of the sliding doors, there was a correlating increase in my heartbeat as I waited, hoping that forty seconds would pass without the obtrusive trio ringing through the tenth floor foyer, and then fifty seconds, and then sixty, that the sounds would have stopped entirely. But each time I heard the elevator's doors close, I would begin my count anew, which would reach between thirty-seven and forty-two, no more and no less. I knew that if I were to rise from the hard mattress to the hotel bed, my chance of banking the pseudo-rest on which my mind and body operate daily would evaporate completely. But the terrible anticipation became equally, if not more, disruptive. Perhaps my first endeavor toward addressing and rectifying this irritating issue should have been to contact the front desk, but for a reason I'm certain I'll never uncover nor understand, I passed by the desk and the phone, which sat perched atop its corner, I made my way toward the door with an exhausted enthusiasm, inspired by anger. But halfway between the desk and the door, the elevator's bell chimed, and its doors opened and closed, and in an intense apprehension, stopped me in my tracks. I can't rightly say from where this fearful reservation had so suddenly come, though uh, were I pressured to offer my speculation on the matter, bearing in mind that I do so with the benefit of hindsight, I might posit that the part of my brain which commands my fight-or-flight responses was attempting to prohibit me from entering into a situation about which I knew so little. Alone in the shifting radiance of that room, I let out a diverse laugh at my own expense. How ridiculous to think that I had so monumentally built up something so innocuous the sound of an elevator, of all things. I realized, even in the midst of all this, that I hadn't even the seed of an idea as to what might actually be happening if it were not simply a malfunction of the hotel lift system. My hesitation was the result of some subconscious fear that I wasn't privy to, one that had made me ignore the banality of the situation at hand in favor of feeling a particular shade of anxiousness at what I had convinced myself was an unknown and something more. But after letting out that scoffing breath and measuring my own self-directed incredulity, I was able to continue forward toward the door, albeit with what I can now admit was nothing more than an air of false bravado, a mask which I had managed to momentarily slip over my unfounded dread. My absent-minded running count neared the thirty-second mark as I stepped up to the door, with my heartbeat thundering in my chest, with a rapidity unbefitting of gazing upon a likely faulty elevator, I checked the swing guard lock, confirming that it was securely in the locked position. I took a breath that was trembling more than I cared to admit, and turned my head at a forty-five degree angle, putting my face close enough to the door that the lashes above and below my left eye brushed against its surface when I blinked. The view through the peephole 
which gave everything, before it, the feeling that it stood, at a much greater distance than it truly was, was distorted, affording me a direct line of sight only through the space between the elevators on either side of the well-lit foyer, and warping the view of the elevator doors themselves, stretching them upwards and inwards along the curve of the circular viewfinder, making them appear as sentinels looming oppressively over the valley separating them. The lower curves of the convex lens pull the carpet, red with oddly shaped accents of green and gold, outward, giving the floor the essence of a hole into which one might fall should they step over the edge. The final seconds dwindled by, each like a separate eternity, until finally the bell rang out again. With my breath held in my lungs, I watched the contorted elevator doors, waiting to see which would open. Set closest to my room on the right side of the foyer, issued their sliding sound and opened, though due to the angle at which I was stationed in bizarre reconnaissance, I couldn't see inside the car itself. When I first became aware of the noises outside my hotel room, there had been a consistent pause between the sounds of the doors, opening and closing, six seconds. I presume that six seconds was evidently without the input of a passenger, and the elevated car would take it upon itself to close its doors and continue its next destination. Though with this particular elevator manufacturing, that destination was repeatedly registering as the tenth floor. It had been six seconds each of the innumerable times that I'd listened to it while lying on the stiff hotel bed. And yet, now that I was out of the bed and watching the process unfold, six seconds passed. Still, the door stayed open. Eight seconds passed. And still, the door stayed open. Fifteen seconds passed. And still, the door stayed open. It would be a cosmic joke of a particularly malicious jester to present this disturbance for several hours to make it intrusive enough to my comfort that I rose from bed to investigate its source, only to then, through no intervention on my own, remedy the issue the moment I do so. And I might have found the humor in this presumed jape, meaning spirited though it may have been, had I not had a palpable knot in the pit of my stomach, a literal gut feeling telling me that this was not so much coincidence as it was malevolent design. I attempted to command my body to turn away from the people, but whether through misguided stubbornness or outright fear, I found myself unable to move from my voyeuristic position at the door of my hotel room. And had nothing happened, had what followed been left to the imagination of some disturbed creative, I might have waited by that door with my eye pressed at the peephole for untold eons, rendered to a living statue by a yearning either to confirm that it was something, or to confirm that it was nothing. Alas, though I lived what some might consider a life in which luck had historically been on my side, it was decidedly absent that night from the hotel in Arkansas, for as my sweating palms began to slide on the lacquered wood of the door to room 1007, my distorted view of the hallway and the open elevator on the right revealed a subtle, nearly imperceptible movement within the car. I strained my vision, attempting to see if there had indeed been a betrayal to the stillness outside my door, or if I had simply been staring so long that my vision had betrayed me. It peeked around the corner of the door, its hand clasped upon the side, keeping the door open. From my vantage point, any attempt to certain specific characteristics was all but impossible. The thin strip of the side of its head, which was visible through the distortion, appeared as little more than a mass of black fuzz. What set that damnable feeling in the pit of my stomach alight was another feeling entirely, one exponentially more pronounced, and one for which there was no debate to be had over its origin. I could feel in the hair standing up on my arms, in the back of my neck, in my bones, and every nerve ending within me, the elevator's occupant's eyes boring into my own. 
though I could not meet its gaze, I knew with absolute certainty that somewhere within the warped clump of black peeking its head out into the tenth floor foyer, there was an eye, and an eye that had met my own and was staring back at me. We shared our mutual observation for what might have been a minute, or an hour, or a day, long enough for me to doubt myself, to doubt my vision, to reconsider if there was even anything there at all. But it moved again, proceeding into the elevator, and for a brief moment of stillness, my view through the people revealed the empty foyer, a study in quiet, unassuming serenity which I, and only I, knew to be false. In the moment that passed, I let out the breath that had been caught in my throat, had time only to take in one more, which in turn became lodged in the very same place as its predecessor, as the thing on the elevator's foot revealed itself perhaps one-third of the way up the length of the door, slowly emerging inch by inch from within a subtle, though noticeable, upward arc. The limb stretched outward in an exaggerated, cartoonish crescent, reaching nearly to the center of the foyer before it began to curve downward toward the ground. It was at this moment that I found myself suddenly regifted with the miracle of movement, and I turned my head away, loathed to see the body which would, presumably, follow that leg into the foyer. My breath returned to me, coming in quick, short bursts that might have suggested to an onlooker that I had just run a great distance. A sense of vertigo overcame me, and I studied myself on the wall, my physical and psychological mechanisms attempting to address this unprecedented blend of fear, disbelief, and confusion. I felt the warm introduction of bile to the back of my throat, but just as it threatened to burst its way through my mouth, I was stricken with another bout of terror so pure that I was again imbued with a moment of immobility. I hadn't heard the elevator doors close. That familiar ding sounded out, followed by the slide of their opening. I somehow found it within myself to move, to return to the door, to put my eye back to the peephole, to look out upon the foyer and the apparently long-limbed creature haunting the elevator on its right side. And what I saw was that thin, jointless, ill-defined extremity extending out into the space between the elevators and pressing its foot down on the red and green and gold carpet. I saw its hand grip the side of the elevator again, ostensibly using it as leverage to push its upper body out, for what followed the leg was the creature's torso, its back apparently arched backward, a larger mass of blurred absence whose dimension seemed a poor fit for such a small lift car. Its chest exited into the foyer, and the prospect of seeing the face which belonged to this bizarrely proportioned thing, proved too fearsome to confront, and so, without averting my gaze on the people, I began to take slow, cautioned steps backward into my hotel room. I moved perhaps eight paces back, my line of sight still trained on the small circle on the door ahead, and after a few long moments I heard the elevator doors outside close. I waited for the horrid ding to resound marking another revolution of this strange, horrible nightmare to commence, though the sound never came. What did, however, were the twin shadows that appeared in the space between the bottom of the door to my hotel room and the floor, first on the left, and then, after a moment, the right. The creature was positioned just outside my door, standing and waiting in much the same manner as an incoming hotel employee delivering a room service order. I attempted to form an image in my mind's eye of the thing on the other side of the door to picture its visage unaltered by the deforming lens of the people, but found myself wholly unable to do so. I envisioned myself opening the door and being confronted by the same warped, blurred entity I had watched through the people and had the distinct, unsettling sense that to look upon its unamended features would be to submit to whatever horrors it sought to wreak upon me. The 
realization came over me, which I thought to be genius for all of a moment, that to look away from the people, to break my gaze, on whatever the thing outside the door was, was to restart the entire process of the emergence from the elevator. And that if I simply looked away and never looked back, I would effectively be trapping it within the car. I was much keener to tolerate the intrusive noises of what might well have been a malfunctioning elevator than I was to combat the monstrous intruder that dwelt within it, I thought. And so I looked away, my line of sight landing on one of the hotel room's pieces of art which hung above the bed, a painting of a park scene in which a family enjoyed a picnic, animals frolicked, joggers jogged, and elderly men played chess. And when I glanced back to confirm that the shadows underneath the door were gone, the monster relegated back to its starting position, I experienced so strongly the feeling of my heart sinking to my stomach that I nearly fell to the floor my knees weak and only just able to support the weight of my body. For, of course, the shadows remained. So, too, did the entity that cast them. There was a pregnant silence that hung between us as I anxiously looked to the left and back again and looked to the right and back again in the hopes that the thing on the other side of the door would have vanished in the interim. But each time my line of sight returned, to that small space between the floor and the door would lose another shred of hope. It was, I think, the entities in action as it stood at the door that imbued me with the foolish courage necessary to do what followed. Knowing that my averted gaze did nothing but the thing mere feet away from me, separated only by the heavy wooden door, I stepped back up to the peephole with my eyes closed rested my forehead against the door for a moment, my body pleading to give in, to simply let what would happen, happen. Though I attempted to dissuade myself from doing so, I couldn't help but imagine the undefined horror which stood opposite the door, its two long limbs, and its bizarre, improbable shape, warped by the lens of the peephole. When I found within myself the motivation to confirm or disprove the images, which my brain saw fit to ascribe to the thing from the elevator. I opened my left eye and peered out. For a moment, I was unable to make sense of the image, which the viewfinder displayed. The peephole made it appear as if it were farther away than it truly was. But I saw the entity's torso and head several feet behind where its feet, based on the shadows on the ground, should have been. It was stretched, Pulled in the same upward fashion as the elevator, and through the distortion, I thought for only a moment that I could make out the vague suggestion of a face, though that moment was so instantaneous that it immediately vacated my memory. I turned away again, and while squeezing my eyes shut, I wished harder than I had ever wished, pleaded with Jacob, perhaps even prayed to some god I'm not certain exists, that when I look back it would be gone. I spoke quietly, and almost began an incomprehensible rant of begging that this monster return to the elevator, of questioning its goals, of apologizing for whatever I had done for it to turn its attention on me. But every facet of my terrified ramblings to the door elicited no response from the thing on the other side. When I peered back through the lens, I found that it hadn't moved in the slightest. And then, with an action so close to the door, I couldn't possibly see it, and apparently made by an extremity that did not cause even the slightest reverberation of motion throughout the rest of its form. The thing from the elevator attempted to turn the handle on the door to my hotel room. The wriggling of the knob inspired a tightness in my chest, so overwhelming. I nearly collapsed with a concern that I was having a coronary event. I reflexively gripped the handle on my side of the door with such force that it was a wonder it didn't snap off from the base. I felt the many attempts the thing made to turn the handle as I did my best to keep it level, fearing that it's being locked would cause the thing to just break it entirely. 
And such is my luck that, indeed, that is precisely what followed. The tension in the door handle gave way in all of an instant, forcing my hand to slide off. I stared at the limply hanging handle with a slack-jawed dumbness, uncertain of what would fall. Would the swing guard lock be my last defense against this bizarre being? Would the strength required to break the door handle be enough to simply sever the swing guard from the wood to which it was attached? And as if in response to the rapid-fire internal quiz, the door began to slide open. In reply, I slammed my shoulder into it, slamming it back into its closed position, and I began screaming for help to anyone who could hear me. The hotel walls were thin. Someone surely must be a light enough sleeper that the haunted shrieks of a fellow tenant would rouse them. I felt the pressure of the door pushing back against me, and while I dug my bare foot into the carpeting on which I stood, I hazarded a look back through the peephole, and what I saw shall be etched into the very foundation of my psyche for as long as I might stand to persevere through its perpetual stance in the forefront of my mind's eye. For I saw the true face of the thing which dwelled inside the elevator. If such an unnatural visage can truly be deemed a face, its effects were so staggering that I was afflicted with a motionlessness more profound than paralysis, an inability to function which I truly feel could only have been experienced by precious few individuals throughout the course of human history. I wished so strongly to look away that I made a silent promise to whomever could hear it that if I could just avert my eyes from the lens, I would resign to whatever fate the creature on the other side of the door saw fit. The pushing against the door ceased, and I saw an almost imperceptible relaxation of the monster's rigid structure. I was able to look away, though I still did not have the luxury of being able to move. I looked to the wall for a moment, then back into the people, through which I saw the distended image of the impossibly proportioned entity slunking backward toward the elevated car from which it had emerged. I looked back at the wall again, and when I returned to the people yet again, I watched as the entity's long, slender leg commenced its exaggerated upward arch back into the car and out of sight. And after a few moments that might have lasted for uh, infinite consecutive infinities each, the elevator doors slid closed. I didn't move from my post at the broken door for several hours. It wasn't until the sun began spilling through the east-facing windows of my room that I was able to tear myself away from the people. I took an inventory of my person, discarded my urine-soaked boxer shorts, splashed my tear-streaked face with cold water, and let out a violent stream of vomit into the toilet. Mine was such a state that I've never, never felt before or since. A complete numbness born of a terror so intense, I thought it itself, independent of that which instilled it, might kill me. Put on clothes, collected what valuables were readily accessible, and left the rest of my belongings in the room. Just before I exited into the hallway, which held that damned elevator, I had a moment in which I pondered the likelihood that the entire ordeal had been all but nothing more than a terrible dream. Would that not be the most digestible scenario? Would that not be a more palpable explanation than that I was the prey of some impossible elevator-dwelling predator? But I knew, though I questioned it in that instant, there was never any true doubt as to the authenticity of that terrible trial on the 10th floor of the Arkansas Hotel, and as if I need some kind of confirmation that it had all truly happened. A glance at the dangling door handle was proof enough. I exited room 1007, and with my back to the wall, I made my way to the stairs, dipping over two, three, sometimes five steps at a time, down, set after set, time I reached the ground floor, I was winded to the point of nearly vomiting again, the cold sweat running down my back. 
I bypassed the front counter and the two women sitting behind it, though I might swear I caught the hints of sinister, knowing smiles about their otherwise convivial faces. I see the face of the thing in the elevator every time I dare close my eyes. My battle with insomnia is one which I simply abandoned, for during even the few instances that have been gifted the opportunity of some rest, it's plagued by the memories of that awful night. The events were playing in the theater of my subconscious with a very clarity that allows me to recount them now. With every moment of every day that's passed since, I've wished for nothing more than to end my life, and with it, the torment of my memory. And while I have long yearned for the ability to speak to my late brother about two decades' worth of topics, I never wished more than to speak to him now, I had to put to him the question that would finally allow me to stop my suffering. For I will not, I cannot, risk the possibility, however likely, or unlikely though it may be, that the thing in the elevator inhabits both this world and the next. I hope you enjoyed At a Hotel in Arkansas by Nick Boddock, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, you can help support him by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash boddock. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash B-O-T-I-C. If you wish to delve even deeper into the twisted world of Mr. Bonnick, well, that's entirely up to you, but you can visit him on social media. See his official website at nickbonnick.com and maybe pick up a book or two of his. If you do decide to stop by the profile, please leave Nick a kind word and let him know you heard about him here on this show and that me, Otis Chiry, sent you. It would mean a lot to me. Thanks again for your support of this program and of tonight's featured author. Oh, don't worry, folks. There's no need to get bent out of shape. You know, like our friend on the elevator? I'm sure it was just the local mechanic, and he was just testing the doors for problems. Very common misunderstanding, really. Maybe hotels are a little too frightening, then. Why not try something less spine tingling like a ride-sharing service. You meet all kinds of no's, drivers and passengers alike. You might meet a few people who had a little too much on their night on the town, or you might meet a gentle old soul. Or at least they look like a gentle old soul at first. Then the skeletons in the closet start to emerge. Without further ado, I present to you Lillian and her paintings of a house. She stood out amongst the typical Friday night crowd, so much so that I spotted her from down the block. It was almost 2 a.m., and the sidewalk in front of Black Rock Saloon was abuzz with drunken college students stumbling their way to this house, or that, to continue the party as the bar is shut down for the night. But standing at the edge of the curb in a floral print dress in a sea of people a half-century younger than purse secured tightly against her frail torso, was who I presumed on my approach to be Lillian, a woman who was, apparently, using Uber for the first time. Her profile was absent any ratings, either of or from drivers, but the picture, which captured her bony shoulders, her thin wrinkled face, and the short thin white hair that sat atop her head, suggested to me that hers would be an easy, quiet ride. For the last year, my Friday and Saturday nights have consisted of giving rides to blackout drunk twenty-somethings who either passed out, vomited, fought, or tried to fuck in my back seat. The old lady seemed like she would be a nice break from the monotony and the mess. She stood as still as a statue as my car rolled to a stop in front of her. Behind her, two young men were engaged in what appeared to be a good-hearted slap-boxing match that I suspected would quickly evolve into a real fight 
someone didn't step between them soon. As I stopped in front of her, Lillian didn't acknowledge my presence, only kept staring forward. I rolled down the passenger side window and leaned down so that she could see my face. Uh, Lillian? Ma'am? Uh, I'm Danny. I'm with Uber. You called for a ride? Ma'am? Her body didn't move. She was exhibiting a stillness so whole she might have been a cardboard cutout. But then her eyes moved, shifted from straight ahead to down to me. Bright, vibrant blue eyes that seemed for a moment unrecognizing, unseeing, and eyes that were looking upon something unlike anything they'd ever seen before. But that blank, empty gaze switched on all in a moment, and Lillian came to life. A smile spread across her thin lips as she checked the area beneath her and took a step closer to my car, leaning to the window. I'm Lillian, she said. Hi, ma'am, I'm Danny. Are you called for a ride? I did, I did, she said. Her voice was quintessentially elderly, light with a subtle, though perpetual, shake, and the skin about her neck hung loose and gently squirmed as she spoke. It's good to meet you, Daniel. I didn't remember the last time someone used my full name, my first name, but I didn't bother correcting her. Can I help you uh, get into the car, I asked. Then immediately wish I hadn't. I didn't want to offend her by assuming she was incapable of doing so herself. So kind, thank you, but no, I can do it. Just give me a moment. She moved slowly, but with purpose. And before long, she was climbing into the back seat of my car, her purse still clutched tightly in her gaunt hands. I started the GPS, which informed me that Lillian's destination was 22 minutes away. As I pulled away, the two slap gladiators were standing nose to nose. Their laughter had ceased, and it was only a matter of time before one of them threw a real punch. So you were out partying with the college kids tonight? I asked with a smile. Lillian laughed. Oh, no, no. I was hoping to visit a place. I waited for her to continue, but she didn't. She simply sat in the back seat of my car, the middle seat, staring forward out the windshield. Before long, the bright lights of the many bars that lined the avenues of the east side of town were replaced by darkness and trees along the quiet road upon which we drove. For the first half of the drive, neither of us spoke anymore, save for when I turned on the radio, and Lillian politely asked me to turn it off. She then reverted back to the dead-eyed statue I'd seen when I first arrived to pick her up, looking straight ahead, but not appearing to actually be seeing anything. But as we made our way around the long bend in the road, the same surge of life returned to her. She leaned forward in the seat, startling me as she spoke. Do you like art? she asked. Art? I said, then thought about it for a moment. I suppose I do. I couldn't really tell you much about it. But I like a good drawing when I see one. And paintings. Do you like paintings? I thought again. I never formulated an opinion on the medium, one way or the other. I suppose, yeah. I've seen a lot of really beautiful paintings. But then I've seen a lot that I don't really, uh, you know, get. But yeah, I, I say I like paintings. I paint. Lillian said, Oh, yeah. Do you do it professionally, or as a hobby? I glanced up to the rearview mirror and found Lillian's eyes trained on mine in a glare that sent a shudder up the back of my neck. There's nothing sinister about it, at least on its surface. But her eyes, a glassy but pure, hypnotic blue that betrayed her age, seemed to see beyond me, seemed to hold a knowledge in like this woman I'd met only 15 minutes earlier, could have told me my entire life story in a more accurate and detailed manner than I could ever hope to recount it myself. No, no, neither. She once again finished her thought with an upward tilt, as if she'd had more with which she intended to continue, but for some reason unknown to me, didn't. The short silence that followed was weighed down by the unspoken continuance, of her previous answer to my attempt at small talk. I decided to take another crack at it, just as the ETA displayed on the GPS 
switched from seven minutes to six. What kind of things do you like to paint? Portraits? Landscapes? Lillian sat back in her seat, her face full, now visible, in the rearview mirror, as opposed to only her eyes and nose. Upon my asking what I had, the stony look in her two blue eyes turned pensive, wondering, reminiscing, and was joined by a slight upward curve at the side of her mouth. She considered for a moment, looked out the window at the blur of moonlit trees, then leaned forward again. A house. I paint a house. I glanced in the rear view again, watched as her contemplative eyes traversed its slow trail from the window to meet mine. A smile crept across my lips. Just one? I said, hoping it didn't come off as condescending. I looked back at the road, at the space in front of the car that the headlights shone upon. The GPS ticked down from six minutes to five. And as we reached the apex of a long curve in the road, the headlights bathed the raccoon in their pale yellow glow and caused me to make a small but sharp swerve to avoid running it over. As I realigned the car on the proper side of the double yellow lines, I opened my mouth to make sure Lillian was okay and to apologize. But when I peeked at the rear view, my heart leapt so high up into my throat that I thought it might grip the corners of my mouth and pulled itself out. Lillian's face had transformed from that of a kind old woman to that of something almost unrecognizable as having once been human. The arches of her eyebrows had risen several inches and were skewed downward in rageful points. Her eyes, no longer their brilliant blue, were now a deep, bloody scarlet. Her cheekbones, like her brow, had risen and were now jutting outward, pulling her taut skin against her malformed skull like it was stretched over shards of glass. Her nose was all but non-existent. Two chasms, twice the diameter of normal nostrils, buried deep into her skull. Her mouth, absent lips, and the same size closed as mine was wide open. It was a mess of oversized teeth, yellowed, cracked, sharpened to needle points. It was an image that lasted a fraction of a second, the one that imprinted itself on my psyche just as quickly. It wasn't even in the blink of an eye because I'm sure I didn't blink. No, her face simply was a lesson in grotesquery one instant and was back to normal the next. I squeezed my eyes shut for a moment, checked my place in the road and looked back in the rear view, only to find Lillian face as normal as it had been if a bit startled. I, you, ma'am, you, are, are you okay? I sputtered out. Uh, there, it, uh, there was a raccoon. Possum? Oh, I'm fine, thank you. I'm glad you didn't hit it. It breaks my heart every time I see roadkill. I was shaken, but what was I to presume? That this sweet old lady had momentarily transmogrified into some kind of monster? Or was it more likely that my mind, fatigued, after seven hours of driving back and forth all around town, had simply played a trick on me, that the moonlight and the shadows had worked in conjunction to give me a fright? At the time, it was as easy as a subtle shake of my head, putting what I thought I'd seen out of it. It was a scenario that was birthed and buried in a matter of seconds, and apparently, sensing my disquiet, Lillian leaned forward again. Are you okay, dear? I inhaled a deep breath, let it out quick and sharp. Ah, uh, yes, ma'am. Sorry about that. That raccoon just, uh, just gave me a jump. Lillian didn't reply, only offered a warm smile. We were within three minutes from our destination when the old lady in the back seat leaned forward again. To answer your question, yes. I paint just one house. Our eyes met in the rear view. Is it a house you grew up in? Something like that? Oh, goodness, no, nothing like that. But a few of my pieces have been in galleries. Local things, is all. Libraries and the like. Well, still, that's impressive, I said. I'm pretty sure if I painted anything, they'd pay me to keep it as far away from any gallery I might know of. Lillian let out a laugh. Oh, I doubt that very much. 
There is no right or wrong way to do art. I'm sure a whole lot of people would look at my paintings and think they're god-awful, but then there are those to whom the house speaks to them. I nodded, uncertain of what it was I was agreeing with. This house you paint, is it a natural house? Or like what your dream house would look like, or... Lillian smiled a knowing grin, and for another, almost immeasurably short moment, the moon's light was blocked by some obstruction, dividing Lillian's face horizontally at her nose, over half still awash in pale moonlight, the upper half in darkness, and reverted back to the grotesque monstrosity I'd seen earlier, brows violently arched, eyes red and hateful. It lasted for such a short time that it didn't take any convincing that I hadn't seen it at all. It's only in retrospect that I know I had. No, no, it, it's a real house. But something is missing from my, from my paintings. In 500 feet, your destination is on the left. I was silently thankful that the end of our trip was upon us. There was nothing unpleasant about the drive. Errant raccoons, notwithstanding nor about Lillian herself. I would happily pick up a lifetime of Lillian's if it meant never again having to scrub regurgitated vodka and Red Bull from my seats. Trying to make conversation with her, even a conversation she initiated about a topic of her choosing, was nothing short of an uphill battle. She was strangely guarded about the very thing with which she prompted our dialogue, equal parts eager and reticent. A house came into view on the left side of the road. Here we are, Lillian said, smiling and readjusting her grip on her bag. I pulled into the driveway of Lillian's two-story colonial home. Through the car's closed windows, I could hear the soundtrack that accompanies the ruralish areas like the one Lillian lives in. There were houses on either side of her own, though each with perhaps 40 yards between them. The area was filled with the soundtrack that accompanies those locales that border on reality. The chirping of cicadas, the quiet shuffle of leaves, as a gentle breeze ruffles them. Thank you, young man, Lillian said. You're a very good driver. Oh, I appreciate that, ma'am. You have a good night. Lillian flashed me one more of her warm smiles and opened the rear passenger's side door. She groaned as she exited my car then shut the door and offered me a parting wave, which I returned. From the driveway, there was a step that connected to the walkway leading up to the front porch. And as Lillian took that step, her right foot didn't clear it, and as she let out a cry, she fell forward, landing hard on her knees and elbows. The contents of her purse splayed out in front of her. I ripped off my seatbelt and leapt out of the car, rushing over to Lillian. Ma'am, ma'am, are you okay? Lillian, slowly and with great effort, turned herself over and sat on her backside, wincing in pain. Is... does anything feel broken? Do you need to go to a hospital? I asked. I think I was more flustered than Lillian. I didn't know what the protocol here was. Since she was out of my vehicle, did that mean our transaction was complete? I feared, perhaps selfishly, that I would somehow be liable for the fall and I had to suppress the urge to declare right then and there that idea. No, no, no. My goodness, how embarrassing. Lillian said, There's nothing to be embarrassed about, ma'am, nothing at all. Lillian reached for the ejected contents of her purse, a hairbrush, two tubes of lipstick, a pack of tissues, a set of well-used paintbrushes of different sizes. It's embarrassing not to be able to keep your feet on you. Someday you'll see what I mean. She let out a sigh, one that told me this wasn't the first time something like this had happened. With all of her belongings safely returned to the room, Lillian looked up at me with her exceptionally blue eyes. I know it's not your job, but could I bother you to help me up and inside? I just need to get into my chair. I'll tip you extra for the help. Oh, of course, of course, I said. Please, you don't have to. I held my hand out, and Lillian reached out and grasped it. Her fingers were rigid and gnarled, her skin taut and as cold as ice, even in the sticky summer air. I helped her to her feet and let an arm cover across her back, uh, so uh, she took small, pain steps up to the porch. 
The moon was the only source of light as we made the approach to the set of three steps. But as Lillian lifted her foot to take the first of them, the area exploded in a flood of momentarily blinding white light from the motion sensor unit fixed in the corner of the porch's overhang. Lillian took out her keys and fumbled through them until she landed on the right one, then used it to unlock her door and push it open. I hesitated for a moment. The interior of her house was cloaked in shadow, and in that instant, the hideous face I thought I'd seen in the car flashed in my mind's eye, and I felt my heart rate increase. Sensing that hesitation, Lillian gave my hand a gentle squeeze, then reached through the threshold and felt around the wall for the switch, at which point the inside of Lillian's home came into view. There was wallpaper, of this I'm certain. However, I couldn't see it but for thin strips between the innumerable framed works of Lillian's art, big and small and lining every vertical surface, sometimes in rows and other times in a row all of their own. Lillian's paintings adorned every inch of the wall that was visible from my doorway vantage. It's just, just over here in the living room, Lillian said. We stepped inside her home and veered right, under an archway that led to what appeared to be the primary room in which Lillian spent her time. Blankets were piled haphazardly on the couch. The coffee table was littered with discarded takeout containers and bags of cups and leftovers. Magazines were stacked upon a side table, stationed next to a large, worn recliner that, too, had a blanket atop it. On the wall, opposite the couch and chair, was a TV hung on the wall, a sort of centerpiece amongst the countless paintings that surrounded it. Between it and the coffee table stood an easel with an unfinished painting on it, cups of water and paint bunched around its legs. Lillian winced again as she sat in her chair, sinking into its weathered cushion. Finally, I took a closer look at the paintings that seemed to suffocate the room. True to her word, each piece, each of the surely hundreds of pieces, featured the same house at its focal point. It's a two-story, single-family style home, the type of house that I've passed 10,000 times over, but couldn't pick out of a lineup. The house was pale blue, the trim white, with bay windows on either side of the front door. In the front door, it was deep, if not a purple that, no matter which instance of it I looked at, seemed intent on pulling me through it. Each painting depicted the house at a different angle, some from straight or just shy of straight on, some of the sides, some of the backyard, and the rear of the house, some from above, some looking straight or just shy of straight down on this shingled roof. Lillian had painted this same house from every possible perspective, seemingly every degree of angle around it. The amount of paintings was overwhelming, seeming to make the room smaller by the second. I was entranced by a particular piece hanging to the left of the television, crafted on what looked like to be an 18 by 24 canvas. It featured the house from an angle a bird might have if it were perched upon a branch of a tree standing in the front yard at the edge of the street, looking slightly downward at a degree, perhaps, of twenty or so to the right. What caught my eye was the rightmost bay window, blended into the layered blues and whites and the black of the window frame. There was a figure looking out on the lawn. I looked closer then, and the figure wasn't looking at the close-cut grass, rather looking up and slightly to its left, up at me. My eyes were transfixed on this vaguely humanoid smudge of black and deep purple in the window. I didn't realize I'd taken a few steps forward and was nearly up against Lillian's television. For a moment, I was able to draw my attention away from it and reassess the house in which it stood. The white trim, the small garden on either side of the small porch, it was all vaguely familiar, as though I'd seen it before. Even in the moment, I pondered whether it was simply my mind playing tricks on me, trying to convince me of an impossibility, or if it had, at some point in my suburban life, actually seen this very house. I stood with my hip against Lillian's television, my eyes drawn back to the figure in the window. Only now it seemed as though it were different somehow, thinner, 
standing in a slightly different position. Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. There's a monster looking just outside your door. No, it's not the kind we normally talk about. It's that real-life monster known as stress. When you're stressed, even the simplest problems can be tough. I know that most times stress is temporary and that when it goes, the other problems get easier. But when too many problems build up, suddenly there's no solution that seems possible. There's a place you can go to get the help you need. Better help. BetterHelp is affordable online therapy that can get you back on track to being the top problem solver you and I both know you are. Just take a brief survey to be matched with a therapist within 24 hours. Speak to them over the phone, on video calls, or even through text, whichever is the most comfortable for you. They'll get to work with you to eat away at the problems that are keeping you from being your best self and give you the tools you need to take care of the stresses in your life. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com horror today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash horror. I squeezed my eyes shut, opened them again, and found that the figure hadn't seemed to move yet again. It was a smaller painting to the right, directly above the TV. This entry in the vast catalog of this house's documentation was from the perspective of someone walking across the lawn from the left side of the front door. The figure was in the same window as the other painting, but deeper within the house perhaps a step or two back from where it was in the larger piece, the same cosmic blend of blacks and purples that formed the head and shoulders of this otherwise normal home's occupant. I looked back at the larger painting, back at the figure in the window, and the blacks and purples seemed to deepen, to not simply be a blending of dark paints, but rather an absence, a window into some distant cosmos, attempting to lure me into its vastness. I suddenly became aware that I'd been staring at these paintings for several minutes, with no objection from Lillian, a woman I'd met a half hour prior, but who apparently didn't mind a stranger surveying the decor in her home. I turned to find the old woman sitting in her chair, sitting perfectly still, staring straight ahead with unseeing eyes. I looked back at the house to the figure in the window. I looked back to Lillian, her eyes glassy. Her fingers rigid on the cushy arms of the recliner. Behind her were more paintings from more angles, the same house. I looked back at the house in front of me, thought again that the figure might have slightly, almost imperceptibly, shifted form, now somewhat wider, perhaps taller, its arm perhaps just barely outstretched, but its whole form still an open doorway leading to a distant infinity. I looked back at Lillian, then quickly snapped my head back to the paintings. Those superimposed over them now were the afterimages of Lillian's malformed brow arched high above its normal resting place, eyes of violent shade of ruby, her cavernous nasal cavities, her sharded cheekbones. She'd been sitting up in her chair, her arthritic fingers gripped tightly on its cushioned arms, her neck craned out as she stared straight at me her hideous visage burning into mine in all of an instant. In all of the books I'd read, all the films and television shows I'd seen, I never understood how someone could become so frightened as to not physically be able to move. Not until that moment. I was trying to move, to turn, to run, to barrel through Lillian's front door to get into my car, to speed away until her home and the paintings of that terrible house were in my rear view. But I couldn't. My legs felt as though they'd become one with the floor, that to take a step would be to tear Lillian's house from its foundation. My breath hitched in my lungs as I stared at the large painting of the pale blue house with the white trim, at the figure in the lower right-hand window, the figure that now appeared to have a somewhat more defined shape, perhaps a protrusion on either side of its head. I couldn't tell. 
With my vision fixated upon the figure, I heard the faint sounds of Lillian pushing herself up from her chair. I listened as she took short, measured steps toward me, her slippers sliding against the floor with each stride. I felt her as she stopped inches behind me, I felt her warm, putrid breath behind my ear. I blinked hard, and when I opened my eyes again, the figure seemed slightly different again, the purple and black swirl of paint in the indistinct shape of a man now seemed to have a perfectly imperceptible conical shape atop its head. Or did it? The next moment it was back to nearer its original shape, its hypnotic black and purple doing more than my immobile legs, more than my indescribable fear to not only keep me from running, but to seemingly pull me through the frame of the painting itself, to consume me and to condemn me to the vast emptiness it was held within. I felt Lillian's breath again, even warmer against my neck and ear. I squeezed my eyes shut, forced out the horrified tears that had been welling up in them. It seemed that we stayed that way for hours, days, millennia, me waiting for Lillian to strike. Lillian, for some reason, waiting to do just that. But finally, she spoke. She put her wide, crooked mouth up to my ear. So close, I could hear the clicking of her tongue as it squirmed in her maw, the scraping of her ghastly teeth against one another. She slowly sucked in her breath and then whispered, Go inside. With those two words, I regained control of my legs, of myself. I opened my eyes, saw the figure in the lower right window bigger now, taking up more space in the window frame, I think. Its absence, an eddy of amethyst in pure, perfect black, and now it seemed to move to writhe within the confines of the splotches of paint of which it was constructed. I saw this peek into an obscure cosmos for less than a second before I turned to my left and made a mad dash for Lillian's front door. I imagined the door being somehow locked from the outside. I imagined Lillian letting out a howl of laughter as I came to the realization that I was trapped that any attempt to survive would be futile. When I reached the door, I was able to pull it open and cross that threshold yet again, to leap back into the world, a place where every surface wasn't covered with paintings of that terrible house and its terrible occupant. I emerged into a world where the air seemed lighter, warmer, less suffocating. I didn't look back as I sprinted out and leapt down the porch steps. I ran to my car, got in with a fiendish alacrity, and back down the driveway with a complete ignorance of my surroundings, only later counting myself lucky that this had all happened in the middle of the night on a residential street that saw very light traffic during its busiest hours. As I put the car into drive, I chanced to look back at the house. Lillian stood in the open doorway, lit from behind, by the light in her painting-filled foyer, allowing me to see only her misshapen silhouette. I felt her silver eyes fixed on me as I sped down her street, as I turned on to the next street, as I sped miles away from her home, pleading to whatever greater power there might be that I never see that woman or that house again, pleas that went unheard. I didn't sleep. No matter which position I lay in, I felt someone, something, over my right shoulder, felt the warmth and smelled the stench of phantom exhalations. Every time I tried to close my eyes, I saw the pale blue house with the white trim and saw the figure of black and purple in the downstairs window on the right. As the sun rose, I stepped to my window and looked out over the empty street below. Across the street stood more apartment buildings, like tired sentries at a castle gate, a corner store up the block, a detritus of city life, littered about the street and sidewalk. No matter what I tried to distract myself with, I found I could think of nothing else but that house, that woman. It had been my intention to go out and find a new job, a plan I'd formulated before that Saturday night, but that seemed infinitely more appealing afterward. The time I thought about leaving my apartment and venturing out, 
the possibility that I would see that deceptively wicked structure tore the thought out at the root. I found it rather difficult to decipher why I felt I could not, why I should not forget the house, why I should not forget Lillian, though if I had to levy a guess, I would suggest that I knew deep down in my bones just how dangerous they were, how truly, inimitably evil they were. It's been said that one should keep their friends closer and their enemies closer. Lillian, whatever she was, and the house that featured in her paintings, they were, or are, the enemies of all things. An evil so pure, so total, that to be anything but the enemy is an impossibility. And still, rare is the person, or the group, or the thing that is evil for the sake of being evil. But what Lillian and her paintings gained from their inherent evil is too a mystery. There's hate, and violence in Lillian's ghastly visage that stands in such stark contrast to the one of the old woman I picked up in front of a college bar, the one that I caught only the briefest glimpses of, and of the house. I cannot fathom the intention of that thing which still haunts its halls, which looks out from its window, watching, perhaps waiting, but as the sun rose on that Sunday morning, as it brought with it the feeling that in order to never see that house or its occupant or that old woman again, I needed to keep it close. One sounds antithetical to the other, to be sure, but it seemed that to keep my enemy close, I needed first to understand that enemy. And to understand that enemy, I could not forget even the most minute detail surrounding it. And as I pondered all of this, as I had these internal pseudo-philosophical debates, I didn't realize that I'd gone and sat down at my desk, put pen to paper, and sketched out a rendition of that house. When I did become aware of what I was doing, it was as I furiously scribbled, darkening one specific area of the drawing, the figure in the lower right-hand window. As I looked at it, I thought that it seemed darker than what the pen could feasibly produce. It seemed to contain within it that same never-ending emptiness that Lillian's black and purple paints had conjured. It seemed to stare back at me, to attempt to lure me into it, to beckon me through the paper and through the window itself. I began drawing the house in an attempt to understand it, and through the practice of drawing to understand the woman who had painted it. Days went by, and then weeks, and I thought back to that old woman's house, of all the paintings that adorned it, different perspectives of the same subject, and I tried to reconstruct those same images myself. As I drew, I felt that familiar warm, putrid breath in my neck, felt that presence of that dreadful being, hovering over my right shoulder, watching me work, critiquing every stroke of my pen, forcing me to depict the house as accurately and as truly as I possibly could. I drew it with a skill I didn't know I had, and each of the figures and each of the windows and each of the drawings came out a black far deeper than any store-bought pen could possibly hope to leave on paper. I'd drawn the house upwards of 600 times when I stood in the center of my living room and observed them, taped to my walls scattered about the counters, nightstands, tables. They hung in every room, in the hallway, on the doors, and when I looked at them, I couldn't help but feel that there was something missing from them. I resolved to find the house, to look upon it with my own two eyes, and so, using as a compass the feeling deep in the pit of my stomach, I ventured out every day, searching for the house. I know I'll find it one of these days. And then my drawings will be complete. I hope you enjoyed Lillian and her paintings of a house by Nick Boddock, as performed by yours truly. If you've enjoyed what you've heard tonight, I'd like to remind you one last time that tonight's featured author can be found by visiting our website. Just visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash boddock. That's simplyscarypodcast.com 
slash B-O-T-I-C. Check out his short story collections and other books, and visit his website for more creepy content, or see what other multimedia surprises he's been cooking up just for you. As a reminder, if you do decide to give tonight's talented author stories a read, please consider leaving him a quality review and a kind word, or a thoughtful public comment and an upvote. And be sure to let him know you heard about him here on this program, and that Otis Jiry sent you. And I'm sure Nick would much appreciate it as well. Thanks again for your support of the show, and of tonight's featured author. Now, before we go, I'd also like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me on this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you've enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium, extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes, Featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com, where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as five bucks a month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Gyrie channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, getting back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, too. Just search for Otis Gyre. Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep, if you can. <laughs>
And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs>